So is it true that there are six-legged men on Mars and NASA is covering it up? Of course not. That was early 20th century speculation. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So it's been a couple of weeks. I, I had some other issues and it's been a busy semester, but we're back again. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite stories, if not necessarily my favorite movie, which is Disney's John Carter. The story of John Carter goes like so. Civil War veteran John Carter of Virginia is magically transported to Mars, known to the natives as Barsoom. It turns out to be inhabited by a variety of creatures, including the green six-armed Tharks and the humanoid Red Martians. Uh, events on Mars are being manipulated by the extremely powerful Therns for their own benefits, and one of their goals is to being down the enlightened kingdom of Helium, and especially its princess, Dejah Thoris. Carter falls in love with the beautiful Dejah Thoris and joins with her to save Helium. After they win their victory, they are married, and he is transported back to Earth by the vengeful Therns, after which he puts into motion a scheme to return to Mars and his beloved Dejah Thoris. The story itself actually comes from the early 20th century novels by Edgar Rice Burroughs. You might know that name. He also wrote the Tarzan stories. And the Barsoom series was extremely influential. Uh, Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, Ray Bradbury all cited it as an influence on their writing. Uh, it certainly played an influence on Star Wars to the point where when the movie came out, people thought it was a Star Wars knockoff rather than Star Wars being a Barsoom knockoff. Now, a science reaction video to the movie like John Carter is a bit tricky because we're here a century after the book was written, and we know a lot more about Mars. Back then, it was reasonable to speculate on the possibility of life on Mars, and in fact, much of the speculation was fed on a misunderstanding. The Italian astronomer Schiaparelli had made drawings of Mars and described certain features as channels, which he thought might be natural flows of water on the surface. These were mistranslated into English as canals, and a lot of people thought that meant they were artificially constructed. In fact, the great astronomer Percival Lowell devoted a lot of time to speculating on the what he thought was the reality of intelligent life on Mars, and that fed speculation uh, for the late 19th century and early 20th century, and really fed, even when we began to know more and more about Mars, speculation up until we actually put landers on the surface. Now we've sent probes there, we know that Mars is a dead world, and if it ever did support life, that period was very short and ended early in its history. Uh, you can see my Dune video where I talk about that. So by any traditional means, a Barsoom video might be very short. I would just say, oh, all of this is impossible, and we'd end and roll credits. But I'm actually gonna talk about this, not just in the context of what we know about Mars today, but what was known when the book was written. I've done this before with a Doctor Who episode where they talked about the origin of the moon. And I said, well, what they said was wrong, but at the time they wrote it, it was right. And I think that's the only fair way to evaluate a science fiction story, even if the movie is coming a century after the novelization. When Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote these books, he did his research. And so while ultimately he was wrong about there being intelligent life on Mars, the speculation was not that unreasonable. So let's just dive in. So the idea here is John doesn't realize he's on Mars, and so he's flopping around because Mars has a lower gravity and he's not quite used to it. Now that is kind of accurate. Mars gravity is about 40% of Earth, and one of the conceits of the Martian stories that Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote is that John Carter has extraordinary strength and speed because he evolved and grew up on Earth, 
and therefore has stronger muscles and sharper reflex than the native Barsoomians. So the concept is legitimate. And we've seen videos of, astro of astronauts bouncing around on the moon and jumping up and down in lower gravity. Uh, people have been on the Vomit Comet and had it simulate lunar gravity and so forth. And the same would be true on Mars. The gravity would be lower. So it's a nice scientifically accurate touch that Burroughs included in his concepts in the books half a century before we saw the moon landings and saw people live this out in real life. But the way it's done in the movie is really not good. John Carter would be stronger and able to jump longer distances, but he would not be Superman. He'd maybe jump 40% higher or longer. He'd be like a long jumper or something like that. Um, but he would not be able to jump half a mile or hundreds of feet as he's portrayed at times in the movie of doing. There's a throwaway line that implies that maybe the transportation to Mars gave him some superhuman strength, but it's really not very clear. And in this beginning scene where he's stumbling around is just kind of dumb. We've had real life people go to areas of lower gravity, either on the uh, vomit comet simulating it or on the moon itself. And they don't stumble around comically like this. Balance is instinctive. There was a wonderful Mythbuster episode where they went into the moon landings and talked about how the way the astronauts moved isn't really something you could get from a harness that you could simulate. But when you're in lower gravity, the way they move feels natural. It feels instinctive. You naturally find yourself jumping around like that. And astronauts we would send to Mars or anyone we'd send to Mars would have those natural instincts. And so this idea of John Carter stumbling around and not being able to function is is a kind of failed comedy to me and doesn't really work very well. While the idea of him having greater strength uh, because of his earthly origins is very accurate, I think it's done poorly in the movie where he's just given these amazing superhuman abilities like he's out in the MCU or something like that. And I really think that, at, to me at least, takes away some of the movie. I know other people didn't mind, but to me as a scientist, it does bother me. Now, just to illustrate a couple of things where I'm talking about, here's a scene where Deja Thoris is falling from a ship and John jumps hundreds of feet and catches her in midair. Now, this is one of my least favorite movie cliches, when someone's falling from a long distance and someone catches them and they're fine. As they like to say, the fall is not what kills you. It's the sudden stop at the end. That is literally true. What happens when you hit the ground is that that sudden deceleration can liquefy your organs, break your bones, just do incredible damage to your body. But it doesn't matter whether that deceleration is from hitting the ground or for being caught. It's the deceleration that matters. You have to slow someone down if you don't want to break every bone in their body. And so by jumping and catching her in the air, and especially because he's jumping really fast, and especially because Dejothoris is Martian and therefore has is used to that lower gravity, has weaker bones, weaker muscles, uh, he would break every bone in her body doing this, catching her from the side. So it's it looks exciting, but it's uh, really not very good. And I think it kind of feels wrong if you watch it in the context. Another example right here, he's swinging this rock to attack a white ape with, but rocks still have mass. Even though the gravity is lower, the rock's mass has not changed. So swinging around like this would be no more easier on Mars than it is on Earth because you have to get that momentum swinging it around. It's not enough to just lift it off the ground. And so this is another example where they give him like these superpowers that aren't really playing into at least the way I understand the story as being done. These are There are more examples of this throughout the movie, but you, you get the point. I think it would have been a good movie to make John stronger and faster, and that would have been fine. Um, making him superhuman might make for a more exciting movie and make for uh, a way to solve a lot of plot issues and so forth, but I think it really hurts the, the accuracy of the movie and, you know, kind of hurts uh, the story that they inherited from Burroughs. Another thing to note throughout the movie, Mars surface is actually kind of a rusty color and the sky is pink because of the different compositions. That might have been known in Burroughs' day, but it would be known now. We've sent probes to Mars. We have pictures of the surface of Mars, so it seems kind of lazy to not do that. Sun, then Rasu. Mercury. Then Kosu. Venus. Then Earth. Us. That is Jasun. You are on Barsoon, John Carter. Mars. Mars. Home is 
Jasun. So this happens a few times throughout the movie where they show Mars' moons. They don't look like this. Now, this is something that Burroughs got kind of wrong in the books, too, because we didn't know a lot about the Mar moons of Mars. But first of all, they don't look anything like our moon. These are irregular, lumpy objects that are probably captured asteroids that wandered into Mars's orbit. Um, second, there are two moons. Uh, Phobos is very close, and that would be about a third of the moon's size, so its depiction is kind of accurate. It's a little bit darker than this because its albedo isn't as good as the moon. Deimos, the second moon, is much further away, and it would just be a point of light. It's much smaller and much further away. Uh, the motions in their skies are very different, too. They're rarely, they can't be close to each other, but Phobos whips around Mars actually from so fast it goes from west to east, and it takes about seven hours to circle the entire planet, whereas Deimos, because it's further away, takes much, much longer. Also, these moons are only directly overhead if you're at the equator, so you can actually get a sense of where they are on the surface of Mars by how high they are above the horizon. In this case, they would be either pretty far north or south towards the poles, whereas at the climax of the movie, they would be near the equator. So I don't know if that was intended by the uh, filmmakers, but uh, it, it is a nice thing that you could include in this movie if you wanted to. Now, I realize it's a fictitious Mars. You can make the moons any way you want. But I kind of feel like you're rubbing it in my face here by showing these moons when we know what they look like because we've had probes on the surface. So this is one area where you could have improved a little bit over burrows by portraying the, the, uh, the moons a little bit more accurately. And now, I've only gone over a couple of things because this is mainly an action-adventure movie and doesn't get too deep into the uh, ecology of Mars and things like that. But there are a few things that the book gets into that the movie does not. One is how the planet supports life. You know, in, in the movie, this is almost an entire desert. In the books, however, helium's economic and political power comes from the fact that they control the farms that surround the canals on Mars. You remember, those are the things that there were these lines on Mars that people thought were flows of water. Burroughs went into that with saying that there would be uh, farms around those, and that's how they would feed the multitudes of Mars. Now, we know there aren't canals, but if you're going to go with a fictional planet, go with one. You should at least have some acknowledgement of how people are fed in this vast desert. The second that uh, Burroughs got into, which the book, movie does not, is how you have enough air to support life. In the books, they acknowledge that there's not enough plants to generate the oxygen for people to breathe. Mars is very explicitly described as a dying planet. What has happened is that the Red Martians have constructed this these vast machines that provide the oxygen needed to support life. And the ending of the book is that the machines fail and people start asphyxiating and Carter races to the machine and using his last breath reactivates it and when he passes out and when he wakes up he's back on earth. The movie doesn't talk about these things but it's also kind of illustrative about how the movie ended up kind of between hops not fully embracing the magical barsoom that Burroughs envisioned but not quite departing from it either trying to be both a modern science fiction movie and a fantasy movie and I think they would have been better off kind of being a little bit closer to Burroughs model. So overall what do I think? Well, you're going to get three reviews in one here for the low, low price of absolutely nothing except maybe mashing that subscribe button. My first review is as a fan, someone who read the Edgar Rice Burroughs book 30 years ago and has been in love with Dejah Thoris for three decades. And I'll say the movie is okay. I mean, it's by no means perfect. I think it tries to do a little too much. I'm not sure Taylor Kitsch was the right choice for the role of John Carter, but the supporting cast is great. Lynn Collins is absolutely fantastic as Deja Thoris, and I like the additions they made to her character. I don't think it changes her nature, but makes her a more rounded and modern character, and I really like that. They gave some scale and depth to Parzum, and I really appreciate that. This is not a bad movie. It does not deserve to flop. It's not a great movie, but I've seen way worse movies than this make way more money, and I do not understand how Disney, the literal princess company, managed to not mark a sci-fi movie called A Princess of Mars and make a billion dollars off of it. I enjoy checking this out every few years. I can kind of tune out the kind of bad stuff and concentrate on the stuff I like, and it does have its moments. As a fan of John Carter, I accept that this is probably going to be the best we can get, at least until someone points out to HBO that in the novel, the Martians have a tendency to go without much clothing. Putting on my modern astronomy hat, obviously Burroughs was very wrong about what Mars was like, but there's still some stuff that wasn't wrong. 
He's right about the advantages John Carter would have in the lower gravity of Mars. Um, the movie exaggerates it too much, but Burroughs was absolutely on target. He was right that if Mars had life, it would be a dying planet. You would need some means of providing food and air for the population. Burroughs was right about Mars having two moons, even if their appearance in both the novels and the movie is not quite wrong. So maybe I give it a C- minus by modern standards. If you wanted to say this was an alternate universe where Mars didn't quite die, I'd buy it. And I don't think it's it's that really that bad. But putting on my 1920s astronomer hat and thinking about this movie in the context of which it was written, I must say this is not unreasonable scientific speculation. The story incorporates a lot of what we know about Mars back then. It's mostly desert. If it, it has water canals, it has two moons, it has lower gravity. The bar assume that young Mr. Burroughs imagines is one of many nations, many cultures, many races, many species, a far greater uh, imagining than later science fiction might get into. And as a bit of scientific speculation, based on what little we know of Mars at this point, I give it a solid B, maybe even an A minus. So well done, young Master Burroughs. The Barsoom novels are genuine classics, and they are right up there with Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, Robert E. Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, or, or H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. They are the kind of informed, smart science fiction that speculated on what Mars might be like and really set the stage for the rest of 20th century and 21st century science fiction. And maybe there's some alternative universe out there where Mars held on to its atmosphere and water a bit longer than it did, and life was able to evolve, and there are vast cities, and on the throne of one sits the incomparable Dejah Thoris. I would like to believe that. Anyway, that was a lot of fun. I always enjoy uh, visiting uh, Barsoom. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of weeks, hopefully, with another video. In the meantime, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Enjoy movies, enjoy science, and thank you for watching.